Okay. Uh, we're live. This is Mike Davis with Lovecraft Easy. Um, today is November the 10th, 2013, and this is our regular Sunday video chat. Uh, we do this every Sunday at 6 o'clock Eastern. And we're talking today to this guy, Dennis Weiler, and he's the owner of Adobin in Bremer. I think I'm finally saying it right. So. Yes. Uh, you, you know, one of the reasons why I wanted to have you on the show, Dennis, was because uh, there's there's a lot of presses out there, small press, uh, publishing Lovecraftian fiction, and you know, there, the Fedogan and Bremer, it's not just the uh, book itself; it's the product. I mean, it's not the story; it's the product as well. You guys aren't. Um, Mass market paperback. In other words, you're printing some real quality stuff. So, if you know, a lot of new Lovecraft fans probably have no idea that you exist, and so I, that's why I wanted to talk to you mainly. So, if, if if someone did not know anything about you, how would you describe the company? Well, Wikipedia lists us as a weird fiction publisher, mm -hmm. which uh, is mostly what we've done, although we have done some Holmes pastiche and whatnot. Um, we have followed the path that Arkham House originally blazed in that we have done some retrieval and preservation type work. That looks like Rollick. It is Rollick. Hey, Pete. Hey, Pete. Um, at the time we Hello. got going, the interest that we had initially was the fact that Don Wandry had been involved in a legal tie-up with Arkham House after Durleth died, and both Don and Howard Wandry's material had essentially been suppressed for the duration of this long, drawn-out copyright battle. Mm-hmm. And um, by the time Philip was acquainted with him, Don was a pretty old man, and quite crotchety. Um, and there was there was really no prospect that it was going to get back into print. And we didn't want to see that happen. It, it's kind of analogous to Durlap and Wandry deciding that they didn't want Lovecraft stuff to sit around unpublished over a long period. Yeah. So uh, we started out with. Uh, do I have a copy? Of course I have a copy. Is it in reach? That's another question. <laughs> we started out with. Okay. Find go back out. a little bit towards you. There you go. Colossus. Yeah. Yeah. That that was our first hard cover. Uh, it's the uh, science fiction side of Donald Wandry's short story output. Um, That's a of course good it, too. Well, it's uh, John Arfstrom, uh, lived in Minneapolis. Uh, the two men were friends, and in one sense, Wandry and Arfstrom constituted a significant piece of Lovecraftian circle and new Lovecraftian circle all the way back into the 30s and 40s. Um, and um, that's a piece from his gallery that I selected for the cover of our first book. In fact, it's the only one of our cover art pieces that I personally own. And your, some of your recent books, I just want to show... Uh, I've, I've got several of the books that you've sent me. Let me put myself up here. Uh, World of Cthulhu. Uh, Gay and Wilson did several of your covers. Gain Wilson has done the covers of all of our Robert Price anthologies. Oh, I see. Okay. Um, if, you, if you look through our catalog at fedoganandbremer.com or one of our print catalogs, it's kind of a theme thing, and I was awfully glad that Gain still working and felt up to doing that dust jacket. It's been 
20 years since we got the first one from him. And, of course, he's well into his 80s now. Mm -hmm. but, Is he going to uh, be the cover for Secrets of Cthulhu? I, I, fair, fair question. Can't comment. What was the question? Uh, there's an upcoming anthology, Secrets of Cthulhu, I think, edited by Price from yeah. F&B. Yeah. I was just wondering if Wilson now, was going to do the cover for that. Now, oh, okay. now let me say on behalf of Fedogan and Bremer, uh, I have not committed to that book and cannot yet. Like essentially every small press out there, I, I do not have deep pockets. It's almost axiomatic that small press is undercapitalized. Right? Mm -hmm. It is unfortunately also common for small presses to get overcommitted. And uh, I am not committing to that book because I don't have the capital to project that far into the future. I know Bob Price has talked about it. I know that the manuscript exists and that it's pretty darn good. I am not committing to Fedogan and remember putting it out. Well, you're, you you talked about this with me. You're pretty booked up for the next what couple of years? Is that right? Pretty, pretty much. Yeah. I can tell you what we're going to do, and I'm kind of excited about the projects. We've got Scott Nicolay's first collection, and finally, as of last week, I have the entire tech block of that. I've heard of that guy. We we've got. Uh, all of the uh, artwork, David Burpa agreed to do the whole thing, interior and exterior, so it, it's thematically going to hold together in that way. Who's, who's doing the art, I'm sorry? David Verba. Okay. He's from up Seattle way. Joshi pointed him out to me. Mm -hmm. And I think you're going to like it. It's different than what Dogan and Bremer has done in the past, but uh, I think you're going to like it. Um, Joshi submitted a collection or an anthology, uh, old and new, uh, weird horror under the title Searchers After Horror. Again, lifting a Lovecraft line for a title. And we have the text block of that. It's uh, the passing from the editing to the proofing stage. And we've got a, uh, Richard Corbin dust jacket for that. Roger Gerberding's doing the interiors. Most of that artwork is done. So those two are well underway. On Scott's book, did I hear that Laird, Laird Brown's introducing it? Or my Boy, word goes around the internet really quickly, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah, that, that was the last piece of the text block to come in just a few days ago. Hmm. Well, that's good. Well, to read, pretty excited about that. To, to, to read Laird Barron, you'd think Scott Nicolay was a really good horror writer. Of course, <laughs> I, I happen to think he is, or I wouldn't be doing this first collection. Well, uh, Scott told me that you discovered him from his story that I published. Did not understand that. Sorry, uh, so we've got some weird mic issues going on today. Um, Scott told me you discovered him. Uh, through the story of his that I published a year or so ago. Fish Tank, yes. Yeah. Great that's, story. That's the first time I ever saw or heard of Scott Nicolay. And I went looking around to see what else was out there of his work and ran into his remark that he was working on getting a collection together and asked him if he would like it to be a Fedogan and Brenner book. So there we are. So it does get paid then. It does pay to get uh, published by Lovecraft using occasionally. <laughs> um, what, why would, and I, I know the answer to this, and, and the answer is yes, but why would um, your average Lovecraft fan out there buy one of your books as opposed to another small press? Well, um, I guess one answer to that is to get something that'll still be on the shelf in 20 or 30 years. Mm -hmm. Library bindings, which is one way these things are termed case-bound sewn signatures, that kind of binding and low acid paper stands up for decade after decade after decade. If you have a, an Arkham house from the 30s, 
it's still not noticeably more fragile than it was 70 years ago. Mm -hmm. If you have a paperback from the 50s, you have to handle it with great care to keep it from falling to pieces in your hands. And I, I know this from experience. I, yeah, I've, got, sure. I've got quite a number of paperbacks on my shelf that are probably older than the average age of the participants on this chat. And um, the glue bindings dry out, crack, so the pages want to fall out. And the pages themselves become fragile because the old term pulp paper. Mm. Paperbacks are generally done with what amounts to pulp in the sense that it is raw wood product and there's acid extraction. So there's residual acid in that kind of paper. And that's what makes it yellow and get brittle and eventually just plain fall apart. Our books are not built like that. The uh, bindings are made by sewing together signatures of pages and then those in turn are sewn together and then that whole thing is taken to the hard covers. Can, can I make a comment too? It's like you're yeah. talking about the physical quality of the book, but someone would want these books because they offer a really high quality collection not available elsewhere. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's so much for the materials. I got a book by Fred Chapel that's supposedly this super high decay resistant quality that I want to compost, you know? <laughs> but the Fedogan and Bremer books, they've just got amazing content. Yeah, I agree. And that was going to be my next question. We you've got the again from the standpoint of someone that hasn't heard of Fedogan and Bremer. Uh, we've got the you've got the uh, Robert Price anthologies and w the Steve the Steve Jones anthologies. Right. Uh, uh, wow. Three of those on the Innsmouth theme: Shadows over Innsmouth, Weird Shadows over Innsmouth, and actually mm -hmm. I can show you copies. Yep. There's Weird Shadows. Uh, weirder Shadows, you can find a nice little image of because it's currently being advertised on Lovecraft e Zine. Mm -hmm. You can find it on the banner there. Um, that trilogy constitutes Steve Jones, who, if you're a Lovecraft reader in the last 20 years, you probably know of as a guy that collects weird and horror and a variety of other things together and you get his taste and uh, his group of authors and the, the people that he knows that turn out stories for him. Caitlin Kiernan, Brian Hodge, Brian Lumley, Ramsey Campbell, uh, Kim Newman, Neil Gaiman. You know, it's, it's a constellation of talents and for many of these stories, this is their first publication. For others of them, it's their first print publication. Um, but you get the anthologist's idea or concept of how he wants to focus on that kind of material. Price is an archivist who worked in fanzine level stuff and has mined obscure little magazines that came and went, some of them an issue or two, um, and again, knows a somewhat older group of authors intimately, and just has tons and tons of stories to pick from. So you get that kind of archiving effect for stories you would otherwise never have heard of. Same thing to some extent with our work in getting Don and Howard Wandry's material put together and out. Most of that had been published, not all of it, um, but Dwayne's gotten real tight with the estate and has been able to go literally through the manuscripts themselves as inherited. And uh, he's doing the same thing with Hannes Bach to find his stories. Everybody knows Hannes Bach as uh, as an illustrator, as an artist, but not that many people realize that he wrote lovely little weird tales. Oh well, gosh, I remember Valentin put out two of his novels. One was Beyond the Golden Stair, which was originally the Blue Flamingo, 
it had been published in a butchered form, and they got the original manuscript edited, uh, introduced by Lynn Carter. And the mm. other, I think, was The Sorcerer's Ship. Uh, both of them were lovely adult fantasy novels, not really like anything printed today. Well, and you'll find a pretty unpublished story of his in the Josie anthology that will be coming out relatively early in 2014. So are you planning a Bach anthology? Can we infer if you get if the stars are right? Dwayne would certainly like to do one. He's accumulating the material. Again, I haven't committed to that, and I cannot commit to it at this time. One of the things that happens with small press is they get in trouble and they go under. Yeah, and that's happened quite a bit lately. Um, it's been going on ever since I've been interested in it at all. And in fact, there have been repeated rumors that Bedogan and Bremer was gone as my late senior partner spiraled out. Uh, he didn't relinquish control, and I eventually got a company in ruins in 2011 that hadn't done anything in six years. Mm -hmm. So I'm in the process of reviving it. Well, the first thing I did was to set to work trying to make it right with the authors because there were back royalties owed for years. Um, it's a financial drain, and I am not going to compound it and become another of the list of small presses that have essentially committed suicide by 30 books when they have cash to do three. Right. Um, and I, I appreciate everyone being interested, and I appreciate Bob Price's enthusiasm about Secrets of Cthulhu. Make no mistake about it. I just don't want to string anybody along, any authors, any fans. Well, Dennis, let me say on that note that this is the exact conversation we had, what, two, three years ago? When you looked at the reanimator's manuscript. You don't uh, even remember. <laughs> He's like... <laughs> You're saying I've seen the reanimator? You did. I don't think so. Oh, I, I'll have to dig through my email, but you basically sent me an email saying you would love to publish this, except you were financially committed to paying back your authors. Oh, you're yeah, and... talking about not the manuscript, but the proposal. Yes, I that proposal and several others, but if the manuscript existed when you know two years ago, I sure didn't see it. Well... You know, I do I for one appreciate that attitude as a reader. Uh, I mean, we don't, I appreciate the way that you're learning things and being cautious because we don't want to see another small press go under, you know, Lovecraft fans. Uh, especially not one like this one, which is really putting out a quality product. Um, if, you know, for everybody watching, if you go to fedoganbrimmer.com, uh, which I'll post the link later, um, and I'll put it on the message board now, you will find that the books are more expensive than, you know, you're probably used to seeing elsewhere. But there's a good reason for that. There's a very, very good reason for that. It's, it's quality, quality stuff. As Dennis said, it's going to last, it's going to be on your shelf decades from now. So. Yeah, I, I expect Colossus and Don't Dream, uh, Time Burial, uh, and the Eerie Mr. Murphy to be the definitive sources for Donald Wandry and Howard Wandry's short fiction, probably indefinitely. Um, hence the desire to have library type bindings. It's, it may or may not ever make something that you would mass manufacture as paperbacks and sell by the pound at grocery stores. But it is something that you want preserved as part of the literature. So we put it in binding so that when the copies go in at Brown University, which they do, actually I'm a book behind on that, but when they get on the shelves at the Library of Congress at Brown University, um, heck, in Arkham and Miskatonic for all I know, 
that they're still going to be there when the new ST Joshi the third goes to go look at those books in 2082. I'm just re reacquainting myself again with the catalog, and uh, every time I do, I look at that Shadows Over Innsmouth cover. That's such an awesome cover. <laughs> Interesting. I, it's among my least favorite covers of our dust jackets. I actually preferred the paperback version when Ballantine picked it up. Yeah. Now, that three books, Shadows Over Innsmouth, Weird Shadows, and Weirder Shadows, Steve Jones reverted rights, and what's going to happen is Titan Books has optioned those with him, and they're expecting to get them out as a paperback set about a year from now, is my understanding. Mm -hmm. So they will be back in, in paperback. For the time being, Weirder is only available through Fadogan and Bremer uh, or on Amazon. That's us or various booksellers that buy from us. Um, so far as the hardcover goes, Shadows Over Innsmouth is the only hardcover we ever reprinted. And I'm getting low on it. So if you want a shelf set of all three of them hardcovers, probably ought to think about getting them pretty soon. Still a pretty good number of Weird Shadows. And of course, Weirder Shadows was just delivered here a few weeks back. There are many hundreds. But uh, if you want a shelf set of all three in the original state, they're going to go out of print sometime in the not-too-distant future. Yeah, Similarly, yeah. you look at Basil Copper work. Uh, here's Whispers in Night. Um, that one's down well under 100 copies. Um, some of the titles that have gone out of print, I'm afraid to look up on the Internet anymore. Um, we, we did a memorial volume after Carl Edward Wagner died, collecting a bunch of his published and unpublished stuff as a memorial, um, which is now on the other side of the dog, never mind. Um, that went out of print, and we opted at the time not to reprint it. And the last time I looked at a copy of that for sale on the Internet, it was in the hundreds of dollars. Oh, wow. Similarly, Robert Block came to us in his later years, and a bunch of his short fiction from his early career had been out of print for years. Some of it had originally been printed with Arkham House, uh, in hardcover, but prior to that had been in the pulps for some additional pulp stories. And he actually came to us and wanted kind of an archival book of his early weird fiction and uh, contracted that with us. And that one also went out of print. And again, the last time I saw early fears for sale on the Internet, uh, it was hundreds of dollars. Was that Skeleton in the Closet? Say again? Was the title Skeleton in the Closet, I think, of, of that anthology? The Block Anthology. It, it's a collection. Of what was the title? The Early Fears. The Early. Okay. Hey, um, talk a little bit about the Dark Detectives one, because I have not had a chance to read that one as of yet. And Looks, it looks fascinating. Dark Detectives. Um, I'm poking at some books here. Pardon my shifting no, image. Uh, right. Well, I've hit our shadows over Innsmouth. Let's see if I can get a position <laughs> for the camera. Yep. And. Uh, Dark Detectives is another Steve Jones edited anthology. Oh, here, here's another one that if you look for it on the internet, you can scare yourself. Yeah, I have that. Don't, don't dream. Well, Mr. Carpenter, you, you've got darn near everything. I don't no, have a copy of that one. That was great. Uh, it, it, it's an excellent book. Has, well... 
it, it's one of my favorites, and I really like Time Burial and talking about how you pace what you're going to print and where the money goes. Um, I would like to get those back into print, unlike some of our other properties. We do have the right to bring that back into print uh, available to us. Um, it's a question of, okay, how do you spend what capital you have and still be able to recapitalize? Now, can I make a comment here again? It, it may not be yeah. practical to you, but I think of Dark Regions Press, who went through a little bad patch for a little while. They make super high quality hardcovers, soft covers, ebooks. They had a change in management. I believe, I could be wrong about this, the son took over for the father and they relocated and they liquidated a lot of their catalog and they still want to put out very high quality books but they, do, they want to do it on a as available not a pre-order basis. So now what they've done is they've gone to a Kickstarter model to fund the publication of a given book. So they're putting out a Joe Lansdale title and they had a Kickstarter. Now they were rather ambitious. They asked for twenty-five thousand dollars, which is really hard to raise. But I think they've made it to produce a limited edition hardcover. And I know that sometimes for these specialty books, if you can generate a, an excited community, if you have the time, I mean, you probably have your own life to live and your own job or whatever. But it's a, a way to get some capital. I have been looking at other people doing Kickstarter. I had never heard of it until about a year and a half ago. And um, I don't know how to do it. But are you suggesting, for example, that if we wanted to get Time Burial back into print, that I try doing a Kickstarter to get people to underwrite the idea of doing a reprint version of that book? I was more thinking like, you know, you didn't commit to the price title. Here's a way you could potentially commit to it without committing any funds. So you say yeah. like, what would be the thing that you would need to pay the authors, pay the artists, pay the bindery fee and the shipping? You know, not even necessarily clear a profit, but to get it into print. And then you figure out um, what are your expenses for shipping and taxes and paying off the Kickstarter fees and you say that's your target. Then that gets it into print and then you end up breaking even or maybe making a little bit of money but then if you sell additional copies through your catalog then that's how you make your money. But you didn't have to capitalize it. Yeah. Yeah. That's certainly yeah. worth thinking about. Um, I don't, you know, I have a, I have a couple of questions, but like um, on this particular topic, there are other people participating um, who have more experience, but there are also other people who run small presses who may be willing to talk to you about it, who've actually gone through the process. For example, Pete Rollick was just a participant in a campaign that successfully funded a soft cover version of a, a kaiju collection. And Mr. Davis himself is thinking about doing some kind of for a soft cover novel, I believe, right? Yep. Now, is Pete going to show us his foot that's falling off or what? Uh, he's working on it. <laughs> Sorry, guys. I'm trying to get comfortable here. We're trying to get, we're trying, Matt's trying to get your webcam for Dennis and you're showing us your foot. <laughs> well, he's also been showing us his Edigan and Bremer collection all throughout. <laughs> yeah. Dark Detective Flash on the screen. Uh, if you don't take anything else away from you on this trip, it's Fedogan and Bremer. Fedogan and Bremer. Okay. There we go. <laughs> That's right. Well, you know, the, and along those lines, uh, it, it should be clear to everyone by now, but in case it's not, Small press people are not doing this to because it makes them rich. Uh, you know, Dennis is uh, not getting wealthy running Fedogan and Bremer, uh, but he's putting out something that's very, very valuable to, to Lovecraft fans and fans of weird fiction. 
and it's it's two it What's that? Somebody got mail. No. Oh. Oh. Okay. <laughs> yeah, Sorry, I was just it, buying an F and B book. Yeah, it, it, it's an interesting phenomenon. Uh, again, my senior partner, Mr. Mr. Bremer, mm -hmm. Philip Raymond, was uh, was a friend of Dick Turney's uh, back in the latter seventies. They were both living in Minneapolis. And, uh, well, I lived there then, too. That's where this got started. But Philip remarked after we did House of the Toad that when the two of them were writing stories and kicking story ideas around together, just the two of them over a pot of caffeinated beverage, right. that that was a wonderful, warm collegial kind of relationship as soon as they started work on House of the Toad um, Philip became and remained for the rest of his life as far as I know that wicked publisher and Turney was always defensive toward him from then on mm -hmm. and I, I think a lot of people that buy and read books and a lot of authors think of publishers as kind of wicked melodrama uh, villains twirling their mustaches and lighting their cigars with $50 bills. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And when you look at what small press has done, oh man, over the last 40 years, for one thing, small press has been one of the fountainheads for people to be able to read this stuff. You could lock into little bitty magazines, fanzines, if you found them or heard about them. Of course, it's the internet age and that's changing. For example, Lovecraft magazine. But you, you could get them that way and get that particular stream of stuff or you could get small press because Ballantine and Daw and so on didn't and don't typically pick up uh, a Don Rondry collection or even a, a Robert Price anthology. You look at what Ballantine's done, what Titan is now doing. The big guys in this area are using small press as enormous unpaid editorial pool. Our selections of stories, our choices of editors, and they're looking at what we're doing and reading that rather than having to deal with thousands and thousands of manuscripts coming over their transoms and having to try and read through and filter that. The big guys are using small press as a filter to have a much filtered down pile of material to work with. That's a very good point. Yeah, I, I look at it as a, as a farm team. Huh. Well, I, I think that the Titan books of the world and the Ballantine and Daw and Del Rey in its day do exactly look at small press as farm team. So that if you want really wide availability for a given cluster of stories or a given author, successful small press is one of the routes to that. Yeah, I mean, imagine just uh, imagine if small press had not been there all these decades, and the very small pool of stories that we would have to read. You know, it's it's a cliche to say it's worthy of our support, but this is why it's worthy of our support because they've kept this thing going. You know, to be honest, we would have nothing because. Mm -hmm. the major publishers um, would not have stimulated all the authors and in interest. They would have published maybe like um, a Lovecraft anthology edited by Price, maybe one, you know? You would not, it would still be in the fanzine stage. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, so the point is if you're a Lovecraft fan, if you're a fan of Lovecraft fiction, I don't think it's too strong a point to say you owe small press a lot. 
Um, and you certainly owe them your support and owe them, you know, buy books from them that's going to keep them going, you know. So. Um, so you're committed for the next probably couple of years, it sounds like. Um, when's Scott's book coming out again, Scott Nicolay? Uh, let me knock on the wood here. Yeah. I'm hoping to have Scott's book, uh, at least at the trade edition level, ready to release at the HP Lovecraft Film Festival in April. Oh, okay. Uh, it may be a little ambitious. We certainly ran farther behind on Weirder Shadows than I ever expected to. And as Mr. Carpenter referred to a little bit ago, there are even bigger hang-ups in production trying to get the Limiteds out. Yeah. And I, there's probably even fewer people out there that know that we do the Limited Editions. They have everything that's in the trade editions. And then they have typically signature sheets. In the case of Weirder Shadows, it's got what is it, 14 signatures, everybody from Les Edwards to, um, yeah, that's uh, the Worlds of Cthulhu one. <coughs> the living authors uh, signed that, as well as uh, Tim Kirk and Gain Wilson. Um, and we were working on getting production on the Weirder Shadows Limited, but the two hang-ups have been the slipcases themselves and uh, the signature pages. Well, Jones's authors for the, for this include Angela Slatter in Australia on mm -hmm. one end, bunch of folks in the UK. Uh, so those signature pages are covering tens of thousands of miles uh, before they get back to the binders to get put into the books. And on top of that, the slipcase manufacturer is running behind. So I, originally, I had hoped to have that limited out in November, I'm I'm now starting to wonder if it'll even come out in 2013. Everything is so backed up. And it's it's not one major thing. It's a sequence of things. Well, this one took up a week, and this one took up a week and a half, and it all adds up into yeah, you're at the months of, a lot of time. Factors, for sure. We had the same problem on, on uh, Worlds of Cthulhu, if you remember. Um, it, w it was delayed, but actually still got out within the month. Right. But when I was sent the signature sheets, they were supposed to be already done. I was supposed to be like the last author. You wanted me to ship them right to you. And they none of, nobody in Britain had signed them yet. It, the, then we figured out that it hadn't gone the direction that I thought it had. Yeah. In, in the case of Weirder Shadows, Steve Jones has been handling all the UK authors out of his address. So they, they crossed the pond once and have circulated around there. They got Royal Mail once. Uh, according to Steve, they had addressed it to an author, but since Steve's list had last been updated, that person had moved and eventually oh, no. they got bounced back to Steve, so they circulated around in the Royal Mail for weeks. Well, thank heavens they weren't lost. Yep. Well, the original signature sheets for uh, Worlds of Cthulhu got lost between me and Gain Wilson. I had to start that completely over again from scratch. Wow. Now, Mr. Carpenter, you were talking about trying to do a Kickstarter for what you thought it was going to cost. How, how do you account for something like that where you're going back to the printer again, getting it redone? You, you definitely have to build in the You have to fudge it, I guess. Yeah, you, you definitely have to, say, have to like, build it. Is this a reasonable target amount of money to raise? I mean, a lot of books shoot for like $30,000. They don't make it. Shoot for like 7500 and they make it. You know? It's like, it kind of depends on like... It, it, I, the more, I, I participate <laughs> not as a contributor, but as like a, a donor. And... It seems to me the ones that are really successful, and Pete could probably agree, they generate a sense of excitement amongst the fan base. Mm -hmm. so there's a lot of word of mouth and a lot of use of social media, and it requires some investment on the part of the publisher to like try and keep it out there like a flashing light and getting a lot of FaceTime with people on shows like this. 
Ma the Matthew, other ones who succeed. Matthew, do I, do I look to you like a, a new social media kind of guy? <laughs> yeah, you, you, you definitely need help. <laughs> um, well, and I, I've had a little. Uh, I actually kind of know how to use Facebook now, which I had refused to participate in before reviving Vidogan and Bremer, which got me going with it. But in, in terms of how much money you need to raise, I, I can give you some things to think about. I, I had nearly $10,000 in advance royalties put up for Weirder Shadows before any physical production took place. That's just the author's advances. So now you tell me how much I need to raise to get a book of this quality turned out. And let's not forget shipping because USPS is about to raise postage again. Gas has been high, therefore UPS and everybody else is high shipping stuff. Well, here's the nice thing, though. Um, if, you don't, if you don't make it, the Kickstarter doesn't make it, there's no harm done, you know. And, so. and I, the trick is succeeding without underestimating the cost. Yeah. It's like you, ha you would have to, like, come up with a figure that you think would actually cover all of those expenses and say, this is my target, and how do I reasonably achieve it? Well, with... Two books under my belt since I took over yeah. doing the nuts. Oh, yeah. um, I was going to say, Philip did an awful lot of the nuts and bolts when he was alive and running it. It was before I retired. I had a very busy life, and he did most. Of it. Um, and besides, times have changed. But with two books under my belt here. I could now come up with a pretty reasonable estimate in ballpark of what it would take to turn out, say, a print run of a thousand or two thousand of a given book. Once I had negotiated with the authors or editors, as the case may be, to figure out those kinds of things, um, but it, it's not seventy-five hundred or even dollars. It's going to run higher than that. Uh, sounds like you're going to uh, the film festival in April for sure. I'm figuring on being there. Yeah. I'm hoping there will be a Scott Nicolay book signing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to get in people's faces. Are you guys going, Rick? Pete? Uh, uh, we're talking about it. Um, okay. Uh, probably won't make that one. There's a there's a lot on my plate suddenly, so we'll see. I'd like to Life. go, even if the you know how bad the fans want me there. <laughs> I can't afford it on my own, so uh, this year's was a lot of fun. That's for sure. Yeah. Well, you basically did a Kickstarter type thing to get Pulver there, which was a hoot. Yep, I did. I, yeah, to get him to Necronomicon, yeah. And yeah, uh, it worked one. real well. Yeah. yeah, part of that was because it was Pulver. <laughs> no. Oh, exactly. Yep, I agree. Um, okay, so it's, uh, it's Fedogan and Bremer. <laughs> Sorry, Fedogan and Bremer. Uh, dot com, um, and you can buy directly from their catalog there for everybody watching. Um, anything else you want to say, Dennis, about uh, anything? Um, buy real books. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I tell you what, I'm very, very happy to have these on my shelf. I mean, this is just, I mean, that's awesome stuff, you know. Trade paperbacks have their place, but, you know, like you said, uh, they don't last very long. So. Well, and, and the e-books, and by the way, I expect there will eventually be e-books from Titan of those uh, Innsmouth books from Jones. Mm -hmm. Some of the price books are out as e-books from the original contract with Ballantine. 
we have not ourselves done ebooks, but may eventually come to that as a, an add-on thing. But the physical books themselves don't run out of batteries. Don't care if the internet's down. And I don't know. I, I guess I'm an old crazy. They smell good. Yeah. I agree. They also have great interior art. Obviously, I think so. Yeah. Can everybody see this? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So, can we see that? No, go up a little bit and back. We can always make it out. There you go. Uh, we have to click on it. Hmm. Be, Make it big, happy huh? belated birthday. So it says, "Happy belated birthday, Philip J. Raman." It's Raymond. Raymond, sorry. Always was. And then there's one from there's a Hello Q from D. H. Olsen. Oh, nice. Hello Q. When yes. when uh, Q Cave died. In Vero Beach, a good portion of his library ended up at the library sale. Well, uh, an, an astonishing amount of Wandry's stuff was trying to get into a dumpster shortly after he died. And Dwayne Olson and a few other people saw to it that all the manuscripts that could be salvaged were salvaged. Um, Don Stransky bought up most of the remaining Howard Wanderai art uh, and it's available for sale and you don't know don't want to know what he's asking for it but if you want to see a bunch of that artwork it's published in places like the Erie Mr. Murphy and Time Burial since Howard was also an artist and did all kinds of weird stuff we were able to use those things as the illustrations for our books so you get their art with the texts. Mm -hmm. Nobody's come looking for paperback rights to that. They're available. Somebody wants to do it. In fact, you should be able to find out about that by contacting Dwayne Olson. Mm. Tireless editor of the Wandry work and archivist of other stuff. Uh, we'd mentioned Hannes Bach earlier. He's getting a lot of Hannes Bach unpublished and published stuff together. Um, God knows where Honest Box artwork is at this point. It's gotten scattered and sold all over the place for years and years. He was prolific. Centipede Press recently put out a book of surveying his art. Yes. And it's quite lovely. Yeah. Centipede, wow, that's some quality stuff too, but very, very expensive. So. Well, thank you for inviting me. Yeah, thanks for being on the show. Dennis. Can I ask a question and, uh, before you go? Yeah. You might not be able to tell this, but I, the relationship between Arkham House and uh, Fadogan and Bremer, I guess, is kind of stormy, but they look to me like they're barely hanging on by their fingernails now. Do you have any insight as to what's going on over there? Uh, a little that I could talk about. Um... When we were expanding in the 90s, the big problem was and continues to be trying to get distribution together. I'm, I'm in working with Baker and Taylor to get a vendor relationship with them, and they make it awfully difficult for a small press compared to a big press. Um, and Arkham House had, at that point, a pretty fair distribution network. And Philip met with uh, with April Durleth, who by then had taken over the, the company. And it, there are histories of Arkham around. You know, After August Durleth died, there were a wide assortment of lawsuits, and the company was run by an assortment of people who had varying viewpoints, some of whom didn't really want to be doing weird fiction, but instead were headed more towards science fiction-y stuff. And um, that was a real stormy period for Arkham 
house. When April got old enough and took an interest, she actually took control of the company and got it back on a track that worked. And as I say, she and, and Philip, my senior partner, Philip Raymond, got together and worked out a distribution agreement to have Arkham House be the principal distributor of Fidelity Grammar for a number of years, all of which was starting to go badly after her stormy divorce and there were a bunch of lawsuits um, starting in 05, 06, and the company was getting in some trouble and she grew ill and died. Well, the next gen folks have not been much involved, but are now trying to retrieve the company again from a number of lawsuits and estate issues. Mm. Um, so the Arkham House is still, they have actually done reprints of some of the older Lovecraft titles. You may have noticed we had some on the table at Necronomicon that we carried on their behalf. Um, so they are in production limited way, but the the real hang-up is, in, in essence, when the lawyers quit picking over the bones. Uh, as nearly as I understand it, their intention is to resume active production of new stuff if and when they can, but the if and when is winding its way through state and federal courts, because mm -hmm. there's a bunch of those assets that are tied up. So does, does that answer the, the question? Pretty much. It's all the lawyer's fault, you could say. Well, <laughs> it, it always is. <laughs> in, in all fairness, I don't think that it's entirely the lawyer's fault. I mean, what the lawyers do is what the lawyers do. Yeah, and I know. April yeah. had done a better job uh, like having a proper will and so on, it, it would have been better. And I guess if that's another parting shot, you don't know when you're going to sicken and die. Try and have your house in order. Make out a will. I don't care if you're 25 or 45 or, or 65. Goodness knows, in, in my circle of acquaintances, a remarkable number of people have died between ages of 45 and 65, mostly unexpectedly. Well, I'm leaving everything to Pete Rollick so he can run the show after I die. So, because I was just thinking the exact same thing about you. About me? Let me ask both of you. This, this is an internet conversation with some witnesses, sure. But have you made out well? Yeah, I do. We have. I don't. No, I should. I need to. I I can give you some insight to what went on in Arkham House. The last few stuff they did was with uh, George Vandenberg of Battered Silicon. He did the uh, August Derlitz Quartet paperback collection, and he did uh, the Arkham Sampler. But and they were coming out pretty well with a lot of regular stuff. But when April died, that uh, messed up the relationship with George. Hmm. I, I don't think, I don't think I'm sorry. I can comment on George Vanderberg without potentially venturing into libel and slander, so I'll stop right there. <laughs> well, again, uh, fedoganandbremer.com, and they've got their catalog there, so please, uh, please support them, buy their books. Uh, you will not definitely not be sorry when you buy one of their books, so please do so. And Dennis, uh, thank you very, very much for being here. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me on. Yeah. And I, I hopefully will see you in April in person again. So. Well, and if not, let's all commit to Necronomicon 2015. Oh, there's no question about that one. I'm definitely going. I'm definitely going. Yeah. So. This time when I go, I'm going to go earlier and leave later. <laughs> yep. It was a blast. And, and my foot will be healed by then. But you'll break the other it, it'll, be healed, it'll be healed, Pete, but you'll, you'll be uh, worrying about the other one. You'll have broken it or something. Okay. I'll bring, I'll bring ice. All right. Well, thank you for being here, Dennis. I appreciate it. Thanks again. Good night. Thanks, Thanks a lot. Bye.
Uh, whoa, okay. Yeah, all right. So how are you guys doing? Good. What the hell is that static today? What? I don't know if it's Dennis, but... Uh, seems to be hey, something Mike, I have to say, uh, in front of everybody, I really enjoyed from a Buick 8. Oh, good. It, it is not mythos, but it certainly has a Lovecraftian sensibility. It does not work as well as a novel, for example, like Joyland, but as a series of vignettes and just a concept and an atmosphere, I really liked it. I'm putting it on my permanent shelf. It, it's Unless it's um, very, 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 very nostalgic. What the fuck? Um, uh, did, did you get that vibe from it, too, the nostalgia? Um, I was more... Um, I was more struck by how he was trying to say the inexpressible sense of the weird, how that there was no means of describing or understanding this. Right. It just was. And had to be it's like like a shark is, you know, you respect the shark. You don't have to fathom what it's thinking. You know, you just have to understand that it's dangerous. The fact that there was no ending, no explanation, it was very sloppy. And it was just so strange. That's what struck me. Yeah, I really... I'm sure that it not being explained would turn some people off, but, you know, that, that's the way... You know, they, they did make that point that you can't understand everything. The, the same things just cannot be understood, I should say. Yeah, I, one re one line I really liked. I'm gonna get it wrong, but it was like, it's not really a Buick. We have to see it as something, so we see it as a Buick. Oh yeah, yeah. It's it's a way that your your mind is trying to make sense of something it can't make sense of. Well, that that's the argument of Cthulhu being portrayed as as an octopus. Well, yes. That's also the argument of Randy Campbell's The Render of the Veils. Right. That we don't perceive reality as it really is. We all really look like horrible shuggas creatures. No, 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 <laughs> man. We all look like Brad Pitt. I know I do. <laughs> I used to, but then I ate him. <laughs> For anybody that hasn't read it, um, it's by Stephen King. Uh, from a Buick 8, and no, it's not like Christine at all. It so. is It is part of the Dark Tower series. Is it? It is. I haven't yeah. read that Dark Tower series. I think, I think, I think the, guy, the guy who dropped off the car was one of those low men who work for the... Oh, uh, see, that was completely unclear to me. I don't, I've not read the Dark Tower series. Yeah, me either. I am sure. It's one of King's best books. But it tie, he's got a lot of things that tie in outside, like Hearts of Atlantis and uh, what's what's the other one was the, the Crimson King, Insomnia? I think it's Insomnia. Well, it's about, let me just, just set it up for those who haven't read it, because, uh, God, I can't recommend it enough. Um, this... Uh, were they county cops? Or they were county cops, weren't they? Yeah, ba basic. Well, you know what? I thought they said they were in charge of a certain segment of the highway, so I didn't know if they were highway patrol. I forget yeah. now. Well, they basically uh, they <laughs> happen upon, I won't even get to how they happen upon it, this, this Buick, and realized that it's there's some very strange things about it. It's not really a Buick. And the the leader is uh, the was it a sergeant is smart enough to realize that he needs to get this thing out of sight, and they keep it um, in a big shed on their on the property for years. And um, you know what happens over the over the years? They describe various things that happen, and, and it's it's a really really good book. And that's a really poor description, but pick it up. So. 
So. Yeah, I got a cheap used copy. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's good. He's you know he's uh he's written a lot of Lovecraftian stuff. Um, his short story uh, in I'm, I always talk about that. That's a real good one. Uh, have you read that, Matt, or any of you guys? What's that? Uh, Stephen yeah. King is in. Yeah, we've we've discussed that before. Yeah. I'm sorry, I did. You, you, you N N the letter N. Oh, um, uh, I I believe I've read that. Yeah, that's is one that of my favorites. About the uh, salesman kind of guy. No. Oh, no, that's well, beautiful things. He's a he's a amateur photographer. No, maybe I haven't read that one. It's a little like the Horner of the Dark. There's imagery from the Horner of the Dark in there. This amateur photographer, he stumbles up on this uh, pretty isolated field, and there's these uh, stones in the field, and uh, it's all I'll say about it. But it, if that doesn't ring a bell, you haven't read it. No, you know what? Didn't you link that to a, um, uh, a graphic novel? And, and, uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. No, that was a short, short movie, right? Yeah. It was kind of a comic, comic movie. Yeah. Yeah, I really like that. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I would also recommend just reading the text too. And I also listened to it being read. I have the audiobook version of the, of that collection as well, and it, yeah, that's a great way too. So, I mean, that is just, I mean, I think he did, Stephen King did it real well. It's just a spooky, spooky, moody, atmospheric story. Well, you see, the, the lack of explanation worked in a horror, can work, can work very well in a horror novel. But he tried to write a mystery like that called The Colorado Kid, which was the basis for that TV show that I can't think of on the sci-fi. Haven. 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 But it didn't work in Colorado Kid because if you're going to write a mystery, you better have a solution. You can have multiple solutions, but you can't have no solution to a mystery, a murder mystery. That's a very good point. I've never heard it expressed that way. Huh. You know, you can leave it ambiguous. You know, you may have been, you only know it's one of two people or one of three people, but this you really didn't know who could have done the murder. Well, does it? Um, <laughs> you say that, Rick, and all I can think about is the end of Clue. <laughs> all right, but that's that's. I mean, even though that may not have worked, you did get multiple solutions. Well, you got well, one solution. Yeah, it, it all depended on one or two things. You know, yeah. who had the gun? And well, it's also like they used to do round robins of mysteries. Yep. And they once had one called Ask a Policeman, which Dorothy Sayers was involved in. And as all the problems you have with round robins and horror stories, particularly mythos fiction, you can't believe the problems that you have reading this story. Because what happens is, the way they did it is, one guy sets up a murder, they got four best-selling mystery writers of the 30s, Dorothy Sayers was one, I think the other one was Gladys Mitchell, I think. Can't remember the two others. They all swapped the detectives and had them solve the crime. So you got a Lord Peter Whimsy mystery written by somebody else. They all came up with ultimate solutions of how this guy got murdered. So the guy who was editing it then had to reconcile everything. So it's like everybody on the same day decided to murder this guy and shot five different bullets into this house. <laughs> and somebody totally differently hit him. Nice. It's like, I don't know if you ever read the Illuminati... Uh, Yep, the trilogy. Trilogy. They did a parody in that of um, the Kennedy assassination theories. There are five guys having a crossfire when Kennedy rides through Dallas. <laughs> you know, like one of them is one of them was John Dillinger, one of them was Fidel Castro. You know, was was somebody working for Castro? You know, there were all these different shooters, and they're all trying to kill each other, and they just shot Kennedy by mistake. Well, I was wondering when we were going to get to that in these video chats. We need to solve that little issue, don't we? The the uh, um, JFK murder thing. Can we get that solved today? Or as a Lovecraftian story? What's yeah. that? As a Lovecraftian story? 
Well, that's probably what happened, yes. But the Vigo I... took his brain? <laughs> this is Lee Harvey Oswald, man. Why well, well the, 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 Illuminati, the Illuminati trilogy is technically a Lovecraftian novel. It is. Because it's revealed, you know how August Durlitz always had great old ones buried under five-cornered stars? Yeah. Doug Sothos is buried under the Pentagon. Oh, I get it. Yeah, that'd be perfect. I remember an older story by Stephen King. I and I don't know the name anymore. It's just about a guy who stumbles in a d deserted town, and there's a there's kind of an apocalyptic cult, and they worship at a giant worm. And they and and he hears the this this cult is chanting, "Mighty is our Lord the Worm," or something like that. And then uh, the guy be, sees this a uh, creature, and he, he becomes mad, and this and end of the story that he lies in his bed and can. That's Jerusalem's I lot. Anyway, I don't know. I don't know the the name of the story anymore. It was lost by King and was uh, severely Lovecraftian. Jerusalem's lot, Pete says. Yeah, Jerusalem's lot. It's sort of it's sort of almost like Rats in the Wolves, though. It's very well done. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good story. Yeah. That was one of those stories which you know when I read it, I said, I've read this hundreds of times by Durlitz, but King just stylistically does it better. It was the old guy inheriting the house and his ancestors were in some yep. mythos cult and yeah. Well that's what we were talking about on the on our writing chat the other night that there's a lot of stories that are <laughs> the same idea but it's the execution that counts. Yeah. Yeah. And of course fire takes care of everything. Or apparently water, which I'm finding out, I found out Friday night hmm. in the, uh, in our, in our Call of Cthulhu game. Oh. Well, that goes back to Frankenstein meets the Wolfman, if you really think about it. They get killed by a flood. They don't get killed, they get swept into the next sequel. Yeah, well. <laughs> it's a time flood. No, no monster really ever dies in the movies. Of course not. They're making too much money. That's right. For the filmmakers. What are you guys reading? Well, I just got in the mail my version of um, I.N.J. Colbard's uh, The Shadow Out of Time. Oh, the graphic well, novel. Yeah. yeah, so it finally came out in the U.S. So that's what I'm reading. It's good. I've read it. Yeah. I, I won't spoil the ending for you. <laughs> it has to do with handwriting. <laughs> the window, the window. Oh, wait, wrong book. <laughs> Don't confuse us by bringing in Dagon. <laughs> you fool. What's his name? Is dead? What was his name? You fool. Warren. Warren. Warren is you fool. Warren's dead. No, wrong book again. <laughs> What about you guys? It was a picture. Hmm? It was a photograph. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just, I just finished uh, Whom the Gods Would Destroy by Brian Hodge. It's a novella. And uh, I thought it was pretty damn good. It's coming out next month. So. Yeah, it's, it's available for pre-order. So I pre-ordered it on Kindle because I can't get a print copy anywhere. It's hard to do with dark views, is what I hear. By the time the book comes out, all the limited edition there's a, there's a limited number of prints, and they're usually all accounted for already. So, which I don't I don't know why they do it that way, but well, like our guest was saying, they they need to they've got a, a business model. They want to keep their margin. They can't probably print excess copies, and they need to sell what they print. Right. Yeah, true. So they they know how many they can sell. Like, I, I didn't want to say anything, but he made a print run of 900 copies of The House of the Toad. You know, that's a lot of books to sell. Yeah. I think a lot of these other Kickstarter projects are printing 100 copies. You know what I mean? I, I think that's out of print. 
Yeah, it finally. Yeah. I didn't see it on their website when I was looking at it earlier. Um, so anyway, Who the Gods Would Destroy, yeah, looks like you'll have to read it on Kindle or I don't know if it's available for Nook or not. But um, it's definitely worth reading. You know, it's kind of a Lovecraftian situation in, in the real world, which I'm a big fan of. So. So. What What else is anyone reading? The Kazoo um, Mega Pack on Kindle. There are a lot of stories I don't know. There's, I read a very fine story by Daryl Schweitzer, The Eater of Hours. It's a very good story. <laughs> Be dark. Um, it's set in the, in the in the medieval ages, the time of the Crusades, and there are these eleven or twelve knights who come uh, in a dark forest, and they uh, can't find a way out, and they come to a tower, and then they uh, realize, and one of the guys realizes that they already were there, that, and that they already um, were killed there, and then these things. Uh, Started uh, start again and again and again, and they can say in, in a kind of time loop, and they can't get out. That's an extremely interesting story. Sounds sounds like uh, the the old night galleries pl plots, but they used to have you in hell when that happens. Yeah, but they're not in hell. It's a, they are on Earth again, but there is a, a Lovecraftian being called the Eater of Hours, a Chronophagus is its name, and. He is he is eating time, but he's not eating uh, time for these uh, eleven or twelve guys. But uh, he's eating the time of, of the whole world, and the whole world is uh, caught in a, in a time loop. Reminds me of a uh, Richard Matheson story. I can't think of the title of, but these guys, uh, uh, three men, spaceship, they land on a planet, and what happens after that? Uh, is that where they keep having to? Um, they, fi they they find uh, their ship crash with uh, three people who look like them. Yeah, that was done on the Twilight Zone. Yeah, they did do a Twilight Zone of that. Yeah, it's a good story. And of course, I just finished Lovecraft Easy Twenty Seven. <laughs> <laughs> just finished what? Lovecraft Easy 27. I've never heard of them. Yeah. yeah. It's just some shitty publication out of Texas. It's not worth it. <laughs> not worth the price, yeah. <laughs> what are you reading, Pete? Um, lots of reanimator fiction. You're obsessed. <laughs> Well, that's for your proposed anthology that you're going to propose. <laughs> yeah, which we don't have a contract yet, but we have a green light. So that's good. Looks like that's going to happen. Hey, um, Mike, um, the uh, book four of Fatal is available for pre-order. Just so you know. Oh, okay. Awesome. That's a Lovecraftian themed comic uh, graphic novel. Fate to tell. Right. So. Man, you guys are quiet today. I'm sorry. <laughs> Would you like me to talk some more? I'll talk some more. You can if you want to, or you can, or you can hang out. Doesn't matter to me. <laughs> All right, so it looks like I have a decent contract for the sequel to Reanimator. Oh yeah, awesome. And uh, I'll probably sign that on Monday and ship it back to my publisher. Who's publishing it? Can you say? Uh, it'll be Nightshade again. They're still alive. As an imprint of Skyhorse. Ah. So hmm. yes. Is it the same personnel? Um, sort of. No. Um, uh, the, uh, Jeremy will be solely in charge of acquisitions and editing. He won't be running the business side of things. So, so it's a mixture of old and new. Yeah. 
So, so that looks good. So, okay, so how, how can I ask this delicately? Are they going to fuck it up again? Um, <laughs> we had a nice long talk about how things went wrong. Yeah, good. And, and you know, and frankly, you know, to be honest with you, I, I'm very forgiving because, frankly, we went through three or four publicists in three months. And, you know, Nightshade's publicity part department shut down and Sky Horses didn't start up. Um, there are... The, one of the things we had a long talk about in the, in the contract is, 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 is what rights they wanted. And they're buying all these rights that they want to use. And I mm. said, but you haven't used any of them for the existing book yet. And, they're, and they had to go back and look at the contract, and it didn't. I, I got I got the real feeling that there was some disconnect mm. between what was expected and, and what was reality on on some of their part. part. I yeah. hope I hope they're leaving you in the movie rights. Yeah, we have we have discussions about that, and there's. There's a it's fair split on series, I think you meant to say. So, right? What's that? HBO miniseries, I think you meant to say. Yeah, yeah, I'd love to have a HBO miniseries or, or HBO or Showtime or, or Stars. Um, <laughs> well, ours would be better because they'd be more gore and skin. Well, you know what? The problem with yeah, but the problem with uh, Reanimators is there's like two women in the entire book. So. But see, that's that's the book version. Yeah, right. yeah, of course. We we, we can make Dr. Version, there's going to be some lesbian scenes and stuff. I, I think Dr. Hartwell <laughs> should be a woman. <laughs> yeah, they'll do Dr. Hartwell as a woman, see? Of course. Of course, because that's going to make sense. Um <laughs> <laughs> but, but do you know when, you know I always wonder about you know because you and I you know use a lot of public domain characters and things you know you can do that in a literary thing but if you start to go into movies do the, do the rights become you know like you know everybody's using things from H.P. Lovecraft right but if you start to do a Cthulhu movie or a Herbert West movie does some different legal argument kick in well, if, yeah, I, I would suggest that um, if you were to do a, another Herbert West movie, as long as you did not reference really anything in the first three, yeah. you could get away with it. And as long as you didn't use the same script. Um, Wait a second. I mean, how can there be so many Three Musketeers movies? Yeah, I mean, they, they all have the same basic plot, you know. Save the king, the queen, right? Cardinal Richelieu. But that's all public domain. It, it, it's yeah. if it, the, the issue there is if you don't, if you can't use dialogue that somebody invented in the previous movie. Right. You can use dialogue that was in the novel. Yeah, and and I I guess there was the the example that we can use is um the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen movie. Yeah. You know, well, first of all, for the book, there was some question about whether or not you could use Fu Manchu, and they got around this by calling the Devil Doctor. Well, they, then, didn't, they they didn't use Fu Manchu. Right. They, right. Um, and then for the movies, they didn't use Fu Manchu, and they didn't use Moriarty either. Well, they they did kind of allude that he was Moriarty at the end. Yeah, and but, then. But but it was the Invisible Man was the problem. Right, and then the Invisible Man. Apparently, the movie rights were locked up on that, so they used somebody else instead of uh, Griffin. Griffin. But you would you would have thought that the Invisible Man was would have been public domain since it was written in the eighteen nineties, and it was right. Right. So. Yeah, you, you can, there are ways around it if you want to get creative, but sometimes I think it's just easier to. You know, and even though it, you got anybody else aware of the lawsuit that happened over League of Extraordinary Gentlemen? No. Well, even though Alan Moore wrote the book or wrote the comics over the course of several years, and they were published in episodes, 
in, in ish, individual issues. Um, I forget who the writer was. A, a screenwriter came forward after um, <clears throat> the movie was released and said, I had proposed a similar plot back to Warner Brothers decades ago. Yeah, when Scott Eckert had to testify in that case. Yeah. And, you know, he called the movie Cast of Characters. Right. And well. he actually claimed that um, Warner Brothers had used Alan Moore to create this, you know, basically to backfill a story so that they could do this story without paying him. And... Yes, I heard that before. Well, yeah. You know what used to happen in old Hollywood? If they wanted to make a movie similar to something else, they would find the book that was similar and buy it. Right. Like, The Wolfman is a success. So I think it... I forget which studio it is. It might be Columbia. They want to make another werewolf movie. So that's going to be... So we said, is there any books lying around? Oh, The Undying Monster. Let's buy that. They got a complaint. We say, we got it from this novel, which they follow pretty faithfully. Yeah. But it was another Wolfman movie. So what happened with the Moore trial? Um, I think they settled. I'm not sure. I'd have to go back and read my notes. Hmm. Well, a lot of settlements are just because... Right, right. It's less expensive for the studio to, to, to settle rather than continue to pay legal. Yeah. Money. You know, a, a lawsuit that happened just a couple of years ago that I found very interesting was uh, the Australian group Minute Work had a huge hit down under. Yeah. And the people who owned the rights to the song Kookaburra Sits in the Old Gum Tree say that the flute player stole his riff from their song. What the fuck? And they, they sued and they were successful. And the last, I don't know what the status is, but the last I had heard a few years ago was Minute Work was going to have to pay them millions of dollars in royalties. Wow. Even though, you know, like, you can listen to it and say, yeah, kind of sounds like it, but is it really? So I, it's like it might be very hard to defend yourself from a lawsuit. Right. Yeah, I that's, think, that's amazing. Go ahead. Like George Harrison had that famous lawsuit, which eventually became the basis for a song called This Song. Where he was sued, and he said, "You know, this I remember the lyrics where this song is written in D, and this song is written in F, or something like that." Mm. I, I think Corey Doctorow has a um, article about this in the latest issue of Locus, um, where he talks about essentially patent trolls and and copyright trolls. Oh, really? Um, and it, it's worth reading. He ta he talks in depth about Happy Birthday. Um, so it's pretty late, uh, early here in Germany, and I think I have to go. Okay. Well, it's nice meeting you. Good night, Daniel. Yeah. Thank you, Daniel. Have fun. But yeah, he talks about um, how some company has, has claimed the copyright to Happy Birthday, um, okay, and right. basically sues people who try to, you know, use it in movies or in restaurants, and. Even though there's really good documentation that the the song was written before they claim it was and all this stuff, um, it's easier just to pay these people than it is to 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 fight them. Well, you know the situation becomes is how big you are. Right. Yes. It's like the Sherlock Holmes estate. I yeah. was about to ask if what the latest news was on Sherlock Holmes. Because there was a big lawsuit about that. Yeah, what's his name is uh, suing. But the whole thing is, if I use Sherlock Holmes or Pete used Sherlock Holmes, they're not going to go after us. But if some big publisher puts out a Sherlock Holmes pastiche, they'll go after the lawsuit. Right. We go after the, big, the Doyle estate. Yeah, well, you know, I did a Sherlock Holmes, well, sort of a half issue. There was like two or three stories in 2011 one issue and I thought about doing one again and then I get all these emails from some readers saying well you can't you know can't do that it's copyrighted and I don't think it's a problem but 
the the boroughs of state is the same way. Um, from what I understand, the Tarzan books are public domain, mm -hmm. but Tarzan himself is a trademark character. So you can you 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 can re you can do a comic book somehow based on the Tarzan novel, but you can't call it Tarzan. You have to call it Jungle Lord or something. Somebody's been trying to do that and get away. Right. With it. You have to do like a novel about Cheetah. Oh, but now I know what I'm doing next year. Cheetah wasn't in the books. Ah. It was a little monkey named the Kima. Okay, well. <laughs> Kima. So wait a second. So is when were the Holmes books written? I thought that um, copyright extended 75 years, doesn't it? Or the last one came out in the 20s. That's the case book of Sherlock Holmes. That's why they have a case. So, but that means it's now like close to 85, 90 years old, right? Right. It, it came out like around 27, 28. So now it goes into, does now it go into, it's allegedly into the public domain? The, the books, yes. But the characters can be trademarked. Is that what happened? Because I was, I was understanding that like one, and this could be wrong, but... Disney was very concerned about continuing to extend copyright because yep. people were going to get a hold of Steamboat Willie. Right. So in other words, you can reprint Sherlock Holmes after a certain amount of time. You can reprint Sherlock Holmes' stories, but you can't use Sherlock Holmes in your own story. That's the, the crux of the issue. Well, if you can get away with it if you're small enough to go unnoticed or not. They don't, you know, like... If they sued Lovecraft in scene, how much money would they get? Right, a couple of quarters at least. You know, they'll <laughs> you could just make up some other silly name for your detective, like I don't know, Solar Ponds, or I don't know. Well, they don't. They don't really sue. They they'll, they'll, they'll send a letter saying, "Please pay us a licensing fee." You know, it's for doing this. No, no. Yeah. Good luck. You're naked. Well, we don't know what's going on at Pete's house. Wait, what? <laughs> wow. <laughs> His daughter. I wonder what kind of parents that kid has. Honestly. <laughs> <clears throat> oh, well, I, I actually have to go and make sure everyone has eaten already. I think I'm in mm -hmm. charge of that tonight. Uh, you've got food duty? Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Right, this was a lot of fun. Thanks. Thanks. Good See you later. later. Talk to you soon. Yeah. Where haven't Joe hasn't come to these in a while? He was at the last author chat. At the well, what? The last author, the author chat thing, the little Wednesday night thing. Yeah. One th is is what? I oh, got one. Oh, I yeah. got some weird it's notification. Just a chat. Or Wednesday chat. I yeah. I, I, private I, chat, yeah. I got some weird notification on Facebook that he's going to be in New York next Saturday. What? What? That he's going to some concert in New York, according to Facebook. Oh, that's got to be some... Can you take us in the bathroom, Pete? What the fuck? Yeah, I doubt that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I, that's why I just to say, that, uh, I'm going, he's not coming all the way from Germany to attend some concert. Well, you know, I don't know. He's He's quite the... Mover and shaker, you know, on the dance floor. Oh my god! In fact, uh, I, I, I was hoping this picture of him it. dancing, and I'm just, just like me. There you and go, in your red shirt. I, I, Wait, I, who are we talking yeah. about? No, I printed, <laughs> I printed out. According to Facebook, he has invited me to a concert to attend a concert with him. I, th I think you just got fucking spammed. For Steinway artist Alina Kuzanrova at Steinway Hall on, in like 57th Street. Oh, I think you can safely ignore that. <laughs> yeah, I think that's, that's you've been, yeah, I think his email's been hijacked. Yeah. Probably from that guy he was complaining about for 45 minutes on Wednesday. <laughs> We're which, public now. Which stays on Wednesday chats remains on Wednesday chats. That's right. <laughs> oh. 
It is not recorded. It is not broadcast. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. You shouldn't have me recording this now. Yeah. You should have this turned off. So, so I apologize, man. Uh, little girls wanted to come in and say goodnight. All right. Well, yeah. let's discuss something else. I was telling Mike earlier I saw three John Carpenter movies uh, over the weekend. One of my favorites. Or, well, let's just say three of my favorites. But I'm glad you finally saw The Fog. The Fog. I saw Prince of Darkness, and I saw other thing. Cool. Which goes back to a discussion about fire being the solution for everything. Exactly. Have your flamethrower. Now, can we discuss the ending of that, or would that be a spoiler for everybody? You know what? I, if you've not seen the thing, please turn us off. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's only, what, 30 years old? Yeah. Yeah. Well, how do you interpret the ending? Is 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 one of them possibly a thing, or is it just what I heard? Is that I got to go back and look at this. Maybe you can do this, Rick. What I heard was that you can see Kurt Russell's breath, but you can't see. Is it Keith David, the other guy? Yeah, I think it was Keith. You can't David. see Keith David's breath. Yeah, that's what I heard Carpenter said. I don't know if that's an urban legend or what. All right, so there are licensed official sequels that Dark Horse Comics did. What? Oh, we're back on this. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> In which both um, uh, John Carpenter and Keith David, uh, not John Carpenter, but... Um, Kurt Russell. Thank you, Kurt Russell and uh, the other character survive and go on to have adventures. Oh, there are. Oh, okay. Yeah. I'm sorry. Neither, I thought you were talking about was a thing. Uh, right. And neither of them was a thing. Oh, that's good to know. But there are things out there. Oh, I can see that. Yes. Well, you know... Right. Is that canon, though? I mean, it, it's, it, that I would, may not necessarily be canon. Well, it's licensed, so, you know, does that make it canon, or does that, does that just mean it could be, you know? It could be. I will tell you that I think they are better written, and better stories than The Thing prequel. Oh, of course, yeah. The, does that end with the dog running? It does. Yeah. Yes. It exactly ends with the dog. So, uh, we didn't hear from Pete about the ending. So, I mean, we heard what you said. I mean, what do you... Well, I'm biased. Get about I, I, graphic I, novels for a second and tell me what you think happened. If if we were to if we were to cut it off then and there, um, frankly, I think that Childs is the least of your worries. Because if if I were smart, if I were the thing, I you know, and I can break into pieces, I break off a piece and I bury it. There's a very good um, story online. I wish I could remember the name of it because then I would just look it up right now. But it's free to read online. It's by somebody pretty reputable. I can't remember anything. Thank is you, Fibro the, Fog. Is this but is, it's, a, it's a short story written from the standpoint, from the it, viewpoint of the thing. It's called Things. It's by Peter Watts. Okay. Thank you. It's and it was I think it was nominated for Hugo at one point, which is why it's pretty much available free online. Um, but but yeah, if you were if you were this thing, I mean, because remember. In a lot of the throughout the course of the movie, a lot of these things escape into the into the wilderness, so to speak, and you don't know what they've done when they're out there. I mean, seeing the the the, the dog scene, the, the kennel scene, the thing breaks through the roof and leaves. Well, yeah. if you're this thing, my first insurance policy is I'm going to bury a piece of myself in the ice. Mm -hmm. And then I'll worry about whether or not I can take over this whole camp. So because, what is what exactly is the thing? Well, I can't it tell you. A, it came in a spaceship, right? No, let's well, speculate. It came that in a spaceship. That is what um, both Carpenter and um, Campbell? Campbell would like you to believe. Okay. I um, have a different answer. He's but, writing. Right? His, he's writing his sequel, prequel, or whatever. Yes. Okay, but just one thing. Do you know who uh, Kurt Russell's character, McCreevy, I think McCreevy. that was, was inspired by? Yes. 
You want to tell us all? Or let Doc, me... Doc Savage. He, he's a man of bronze in the original short story. Yep. Okay, so then why is there a spaceship if he didn't come in a spaceship? If it didn't come in a spaceship? Well, we have spaceships on this planet. Okay. Gal, sometimes <laughs> they just don't get off the ground. All right. Is, uh, the, is the thing evil, or is it just trying to survive? All right. Uh, I can give one possible explanation based on okay. that. Go My ahead. suspicion would be that it could have been an attempt to create a spaceship by the elder things, and what we're really dealing with is Shaga. Ah, uh, yeah. Oh, darn. <laughs> I would never have thought of that. <laughs> Yeah, it's definitely sugar. Like, yeah, well, we know that's where you're going, Pete. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, um, so if you look at if you look at yeah, where, are you writing a story about this? Oh my god! <laughs> if you look at when who goes there was written, and, and and Campbell, who's who at times is very critical of Lovecraft, it's almost as if Campbell is writing a sequel. To at the mountains of madness. So the one thing that you would have to rationalize is that you know, like in in the movie, the thing we really don't know what this thing's natural form is. Sometimes it looks like it takes a spider-like shape, but that might just right. be uh, transitory. They do. They they they're the guys who found it in the ice in the short story. It is in this previous camp. Right. And when they find it, it looks like something with three eyes or. And tentacles for hair, yes. You can see a picture of it in Barlow's Guide to Extraterrestrials. Yes. It was a, 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 for those who don't know what that was, that was a trade paperback. It was illustrations of famous science fiction creatures, including the great old ones from At the Mountains of Madness, the star-headed beings. Yes, except I have the hardcover, but okay. I just posted the link on the message board that if, for anyone that's interested, on my audio page, if you go scroll down almost to the bottom to Lovecraft influenced audios, there's a Who Goes There audio drama. And to be honest with you, I think that Who Goes There is is a freaking awesome story. Yeah. Um, and to me, it, it is one of those. If you if you've ever seen The Abyss or Leviathan. Or Deep Star Six. There was that summer of like five underwater movies where yeah. they're all trapped in a can and there's a monster coming to get them. Man, that all harkens back to this tight, you know, military guys in in a can. And I think that's all cannibals who goes there. Would you put Alien in that? Uh, uh, or it's the thing. For, or it's the thing from Beyond Space was the one that really started Alien. Yeah, but you know. <sighs> To me, a Aliens gothic horror novel. It's it's a whole bunch of guys in in a in a, a caravan going down the road, and they see a light in a castle, and they go investigate the castle. Yeah, it's a monster. It's I mean, it's a it it's a haunted house in space almost. Yeah, and then things go bad. Um, mayhem, mayhem, mayhem. Yeah. Um, well, it was a little more like. Well, they landed on Mars and something hitchhikes. Right, right. I yeah, have not yeah. seen the original Alien in so long. I should watch that tonight. <laughs> I mean, everybody talks about how Lovecraftian Alien is, and it is from a sort of the artwork. H.R. Geiger's artwork is really the first attempt to do sort of this biomechanical, non anthropomorphic. Yeah. Yeah, I hear that too, Rick. I, I, I don't see what's so crafting about it. No. Pro Prometheus, you will say, is more of craft. I, I will yeah. go with that. Um, actually, uh, something I watched yesterday, I thought was not only possible... You could interpret it as Lovecrafting if you wanted it to. Okay. Uh, and that was Europa Report. Good movie. Um... And I thought, first of all, I thought it gained this whole sort of credibility in that 
it shows you how boring and dangerous space flight really is. Very realistic. And yeah, you know, and, and that's one of the things I loved about 2001. Um, in that it's just a lot of people doing nothing. And Europa Report is now on Netflix. Right, and that's why I was able to watch it um, instantly. But and, and then like the last half hour of the movie, everything happens. Um, and there is a possibility of, of some Lovecraftian theme to that, uh, it, if you want to see it that way. There is. I'm not going to give away the ending, obviously, but I will say, what were they talking about? The the ocean and Europa, and how it's uh, 60 miles deep as opposed to our deepest deepest point in our oceans is uh, seven or eight miles deep. Right. Now a 60 mile deep ocean in an alien world. Yeah, I see that as all crafty. <laughs> you know? Yeah, because you have a, a mile-long thing just walking by, and you don't even notice it. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I thought that was a really, really decent movie. But I, I was really, really impressed with with the tedium that was and how that was handled. That these guys, after being in, in space for months, had psychological problems... Um, had personality issues between each other, and and that created issues. Well, you know, it takes a long time to get to a place like Europa, which is a uh, moon of Saturn, if I remember correctly. Uh, Jupiter. Jupiter, I'm sorry. I knew it was one of the big gas giants. Um, and most space movies do not... The, the issue of distance is sort of uh, shoved to the side and mm -hmm. this is only in our own solar system but the you know the months and months it took to get there and how far away everything is and how empty space is and how dangerous it is yeah I mean in I like that scene in in, in five minutes there are two fatal incidents mm -hmm. that if you were were not in space, would not be an issue. Um, and they're stupid little things, mm -hmm. but one guy ends up dead because of it. So. Well, you know, which is why I, I'm really disappointed in humans in the first place because we're not reaching out into space like we should be. But to me, the first step of reaching out into space is, uh, you know, robots and drones. That can, I forget the proper name for for this, but uh, they use, they can use materials on distant planets or moons to replicate themselves. Von Neumann machines. Pardon me. Von Neumann machines. Yeah. Thank you, Von Neumann. But regardless of whether we would have that capability for a long time or not. You know, you we're, we're, you and I are talking right now. We're not we're we're hundreds hundreds of miles apart. Now, there's there's no reason initially for humans to go that far into space. You know, we can we got cameras and <laughs> you know, we can explore remotely. Well, and, and you know, and that is a a point that's been made a lot in that. And they make it in Europa report that when you actually want to send people someplace, that your whole mission parameters change. Mm -hmm. And you have to talk about heat and light and food and water and oxygen and all in keeping people alive for that extended period of time, let alone personality issues. Um it's it's just from a money standpoint, it's far more expensive. Right, right. You remember when like the the old concept was throw people into suspended animation for these incredibly long uh, flights. Right. Yeah. That you know, Lost in Space and Planet of the Apes both use that. Yeah. And to me, that's very impractical because something will go wrong while you're. Right. <laughs> yeah. Oh well. Um. There was a Dennis. Oh, I can't think of the actor's name. Hopper? No. Um, 
Was it Pandorica? Pandora? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I know. I, I've not seen that movie yet. Is that worth seeing? Yeah, it's 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 not bad if you're not paying for it. Is it Lovecraftian? Um, a lot of people would say yes, and I would say no. So, yeah, I, it just I just never picked it up because I didn't I didn't think it was didn't look quite good enough. Yeah. But anyway, what were you gonna say? Anyway, there's a in this, this in Pandora uh, the the main character is is awakened from from cryo sleep. Right. On a, a very large, essentially generation spaceship, and uh, has to deal with uh, all the things that had been woken up before he was wake awakened. Mm -hmm. So, is it a good movie from a horror standpoint? Yeah, from a horror standpoint, it's a decent movie. No, so, but um, I've always I've always been fascinated by by that concept of, of putting people to sleep for long periods of time and letting the computer run the ship and then only awakening the guys when you absolutely need them. Me too. And can you... That, that would be a great series of stories. Uh, just waking up your character when you need... when, when something interesting is happening. Oh, well, that was an alien as well. Yeah. At the end. Right. You know, and, go ahead, I'm sorry. And, and in Prometheus, that's essentially what happens, is that the, the robot takes care of the ship yeah. for the whole trip. In where? In Prometheus. Prometheus, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, was it David? Yeah. yeah. In the Michael Fassbender character. Right. But in the meanwhile, you know, while he's in, I, I I kind of thought that this was the plot or the the subtext is that because he was alone for so long, he did go a little stir crazy. Yeah. And was able to, you know, basically one fell in love with this girl, even though she was asleep, by looking at her dreams, and that jeopardized the mission. And you got that you fell in love with her? I didn't get that. Yeah, I didn't get that either, but maybe, okay. maybe, maybe I have to rewatch it now. Now you have a different interpretation. Well, I'm not saying you're wrong. I know, I, you know, and maybe I, I've misread it, and maybe love is not the wrong, right word. Maybe infatuation is the right word. But, you know, to me, if, if what the, the message I got was that he was just, he knew everything about her, that he had scrolled through her life. Yeah. Definitely that, yeah. Obsessed and, might be the better word. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Obsessed is probably the better word, but that that emotion jeopardizes the rest of the mission because he can't differentiate between the two, and it's possible because she had knowledge of things and, and experience with things that he ha he didn't, and he wanted to learn from her, or at least from her memories. Well, and I could all be bullshitting on this, but I, I didn't have much respect for her as a scientist. I can tell you that. Well, there are some. There's a great piece of bad science in that movie. What? That, that's because I choose to believe bullsh bullshit. Um. Well, there's a couple bad pieces of you know. They talk about how far they are, and it's it. They don't talk about light years. They talk about kilometers or thousands, millions of kilometers. Which drives me nuts. But there's a scene where the dead bot they found the, the dead humanoids. Yeah. And they analyze them and they say, oh, we've carbon dated these to a couple hundred thousand years ago. Well, carbon dating, the way you do carbon dating is it's a ratio of C13 to C14. And basically, you take the amount of C13 that you think was on the planet in the beginning, which you back calculate from the amount that you have now, and you ratio that to C14, and that gives you the decay rate, which gives you a kind of time step for how, how old things are. 
Oh, I see what you're saying. They have no basis to do that with. The one, so one, they have no basis to do that with on this planet. So good luck doing that in 30 seconds. And two, it, even if you did, it would only work if these people were tied to the um, carbon cycle on the planet. And they're not. They're spacefarers. Yeah. So you don't know the source of their carbon. And, and you know, I'm just geeking out here because this is science that I love. Mm. But, yeah. You, even in, in, in systems, like when we do this with fish, you can see, you can see a difference in the, car, in the C13, C14 ratio when fish live in a marsh or when they live in a canal. So when you do this with alien life forms that have probably spent the vast majority of their life living in a, in a starship, you really have no basis to make any of those, those justification, you know, guesses. Um, so they could potentially be millions of years old. Well, since you went into bad science, can I go into a bad peeve about a, 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 an actual Lovecraftian movie? Yeah. Like theology? Oh, I like Prince of Darkness, but there's a scene in there where you know Donald Pleasance is his priest and discovers he's been lied to all these years by the Catholic Church, and he, he, he he's going into something saying, so at some point the Catholic Church decided hundreds of years ago that they're not going to admit the existence of an evil being. They're going to say that evil only exists in man. Right. Being raised as a Catholic, I know. But that is totally false. Up until the 60s, every the emphasis was on the devil. People did get burned at witches by the Catholic Church for reasons for centuries. And only after the Vatican Council did, in a de facto sense, the emphasis became that evil exists in man, even though it was never formally issued as doctrine, but it's what you got from the enlightened members of the Catholic clergy and theology class. Yeah. And they just ignored it. The devil got ignored in the 60s. Stephen King writes about this actually in Salem's Lot. He goes into his priest character. So I was just saying, got that totally wrong. Yeah, I see your point. Overall, though... Uh, Excellent movie. Yeah. I'm sorry, I missed which movie it was. Prince of Darkness. Oh, okay. You know, now, if you want to watch another John Carpenter film, please stand by because I can't even hear myself. <laughs> all right. You, you notice that all the he does all, he generally does the music for all his movies. Yes, yeah. he does. And it's yeah. all very similar. Yes. But the thing I've got to look up if, 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 if the thing is credited to Ennio Morricone who did all the spaghetti westerns and a lot of other stuff, right? And I'm going even though it's somebody else doing the composing, you still get that done, done, you know, yeah, little one note that kind of repeats over and over again to build up suspense. So if you if you want to see a, another really good John Carpenter movie. And it's a non-zombie zombie movie. Assault on Precinct 13, the original. See, I've never seen that. I've never seen that either, but I guess it's just sh it's shooting criminals instead of shooting zombies. Yeah, they're, I mean, essentially they're locked, they're, they, this um, bus full of prisoners uh, takes a break at a, a, a um, police substation in a bad part of town that's supposed to be shut down in the next 24 hours. And they shut everything down early because that's what happens. And um, the uh, criminal element in the area tends to uh, attack the remaining cops in wave after wave after wave. So even though they're criminals, um, they're, it's, it's very zombie-like. Well, you know, that's a what, what you might call the Siege movie. Yeah. Which takes back, I mean, there were a lot of movies made during the classic sound era of Hollywood where you have the same situation, but it's the cavern on the frontier, and it's wave after wave of American Indians. In fact, it right. migrated over into uh, 
television. Yep. I remember Bonanza was an episode like that, except they, I think they were in a cave rather than in a canyon. They had some guy prisoner. And every, you know, every Indian in the world, <laughs> it looked like, was coming wave after wave to attack the car rights. Right. Right. So you saw The Fog, you saw Prince of Darkness, and you saw The Thing. Yeah, I've seen Halloween already. You know. All right, so uh, In the Mouths of Madness. I've seen that, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, damn yeah, good movie. Which is probably the most overtly Lovecraftian of all. Right, right. Mrs. Pickman and whatever. Yes. Yeah. You, know, you can see you know, he's wearing Lovecraft on his sleeve in these movies. Well, it, it, well, in Prince of Darkness, did you notice the name of the male and female lead? Hmm. Go ahead. I, I don't remember it. One is, the man is named Marsh. Right. And the woman is named Danforth. Danforth. Okay. All right. Yeah. yeah like so, shadow over in his mouth and at the Mountains of Madness. Yep. Um, hom hom homages. No. So. Now, you were telling me in the fog that there was something was the names of the streets. I got the Arkham Reef reference. Right. When she's um, announcing across the, the, the radio as the fog moving across the city, um, yeah, I may be remembering this wrong, but I think it's right. Um, the names of the streets are like Armitage, Dan, you know, it's, they're all Lovecraft characters. He may have said Armitage. I couldn't catch any, you know, I was listening back to that. Yeah. It's something I, very close to Armitage. Yeah. But, it, you know, it was like the first street she mentioned, but everything else then seemed to be something else. I, I think it's easier to see in um, in the novelization. You know, there's a... Well, they may have altered the, the, the dialogue in the novelization. Yeah, they do. Uh, there's a very good scene in The Fog that I've always really, really, really enjoyed. And, you know, when... Uh, with Tom Watkins, is that the actor's name? Yeah, I think you mean. You, you mean the, yeah, I know who you mean. You mean the guy yeah, in the call with Jamie Lee Curtis. Yeah, he takes Jamie Lee Curtis's character out to look for his friends out on the ocean, and uh, then they find the the boat, and obviously they're, uh, you know, dead and everything. But then while they're waiting for the coast guard, and they're they're sitting in the boat talking, and he tells the story of. What happened to him? What his, what happened? His dad. He tells the story of what happened to his dad when he was a kid, about the dad comes upon this ship that's empty and the coffee's still steaming in the cups. Uh, I thought that was a very very good scene. I really like the atmosphere of that. So, the also good theme of that is the sins of the father, meaning. Your ancestors did something bad, mm -hmm. and you hear all of them as heroes, which yeah. you know, is is very American. Because if you look down on it, we were founded on an economy based on slavery. Yeah. You know, Mike, I'm just going to say this right now. Mm -hmm. Kimberly Smeltzer needs to stop sniping from the peanut gallery and get <laughs> on the video one night. Well, she's been coming on. Uh, she's been coming on the games Friday night. So. All right. So, because yeah. she has some very poignant comments that need to be made. Yep, she does. So there you go, Ken. <laughs> yeah. Well, now I can't decide if I want to rewatch Alien or The Fog or. Uh, Prince of Darkness tonight. <laughs> or watch Dark Intruder for the first time. Yes, I should do that, yeah. I mean, it's only 58 minutes, Mike. Yeah, I'm going to watch it, I promise. <laughs> it's not like, you know, I mean, the thing is, uh, I, I mean, the thing and uh, Prince of Darkness were over 90 minutes. Yeah. I think so he did that for you. Solid. They were almost two hours. One was 102 minutes, I can't remember what the other one was. Yeah. Yeah, you're yeah, right. You watch, you, especially you before they take it off the air. Yeah. Off of that website. Did you guys ever see that movie that Joe's always going on about? The oh, Stalker. 
Yes, I have. Yes, we. It's very slow moving in the beginning. Yeah, you have to be paid. I mean, it's 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 it, it's. I, I won't say it's 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 a worthwhile film, but you need to be patient. Yeah, it's a very long film, isn't it? Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Not quite as long as his other movie. What's his other movie? It, it, didn't he do Solaris? Oh, yeah. you, know, you mean the director? Yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah, he probably did Solaris. Let me double check that. Solaris so, is the bane of my existence. Huh, why? Um, there's a... The original Solaris, which is, a, I guess, a Soviet film, is uh, and I'm looking. I'm trying to remember it. Um, it's based on a novel, on a Russian a Soviet novel too. Yeah, um, it's a 1961 novel by Stanislaw Lem. It was made into a 1968 movie by uh, Nirenberg, which is not the guy. Oh, and it was a 72 mo- 1972 film by Tarko- Tarkovsky, who is the guy who did um, uh, Stalker, and. Um, the uh, it's it's 165 minutes long. Mm. So it's it's very long, but essentially the, the this guy is is a efficiency expert, and he's he's being sent to the planet this the um the state the the space station that's on Solaris because there's cost overruns. But you get there, and there's, like, Greek pillars and statues and grandfather clocks. and Which are very inexpensive. <laughs> exactly. And, you know, really easy to shoot into space, right? Right. You know, so here's, you know, you know so it's sort of, like, ridiculous. You know, I think all that stuff is supposed to represent, you know, corruption and imperialism and um, whatnot. But what really drives me nuts is there's this scene where the main character has to go from his hotel to a meeting in a cab. And he gets in the cab. Whoa, what was that? It was my wife sneezing. Okay. (laughs) He gets into the cab, and sitting next to him is his wife who we've already established is dead. So the, 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 the point of this is that he's, it's supposed to make, make, you know, make you realize that this guy is haunted by the memory of his dead wife, mm-hmm. which will become important later in the movie. Right. The problem is that they actually take the trip from the hotel to the meeting place in real time, which is about 35 minutes long. So you're what just watching this guy sitting next to his his wife, no conversation, driving Wait, through. Movie, the movie goes 35 minutes. Him just sitting in this cab with his wife. I swear to God. That's stupid. It's, it's, but it's a Soviet film. At this point, you want to leave. Nothing's it, happening. Exactly. But I can kind of see the exact same things going on in Stalker. Yeah. Well, well, you know, sometimes yes, there is. Sometimes you need patience to appreciate something. Well, right, and sometimes you just need is, a fast forward button. Well, well, well. I just remember when I was, you know, you know, I'm a big Dark Shadows fan now. But when I I started to watch the series from the beginning, when I was a kid, and first of all, they weren't overtly supernatural. It took them a while to get there. But it's like, you know, it's a soap opera. All these people are talking to. Around and nothing happens. And even when I heard a vampire was on the show, I said, "Oh, I'll watch it." I tuned in for the one night where Barnabas is only talking and moping around about how horrible it is to be a vampire. There's no fangs, no coffin. <laughs> I, I just wasn't into that. The only that quality reason, programming. The only reason I got into it was my grandparents used to watch General Hospital before it, so they would watch it. So I was catching bits, near, you know, when it was getting interesting. Yet. This girl locked in the basement, you know, and what up? Then, then I was going, oh, this, this, this is getting good. Let me watch it now. So, it, I mean, is Stalker Lovecraftian? Because that's that's why I would watch it. I mean, it's that's a little, 
it's a little like the color out of space. There's something was a meteor hit. Right. Well, and it's it's based on a sta another Stanislaw Lem story called um, Roadside Picnic, um, which is a great story, essentially about um, the search for alien garbage. Um, you know, the concept that aliens who come to Earth, you know, just to take a break. And <laughs> you, mean, you mean we're dealing with all their uh, bathroom leftovers? Yeah, yeah, whatever, you know, if, when we stop and take a break, you might lose a, you know, a McDonald's wrapper or a fork or something, right? Yeah. And then you don't worry about it, right? Well, the same thing goes for aliens. If they leave something like that behind, it's no big deal for them. But for us, it's a hugely important issue because th that that kind of technology could change our planet. Mm -hmm. Well, well, that kind of uh, reminds. I mean, the, the, there's a story by Richard Tierney where it is called the Seat of the Star God. Right. It was revealed that the color of the space is really has to the unspeakable Jack and off more or less. <laughs> <laughs> If you think about it, you yeah, no. start. <laughs> that's that's where all these Colorado spaces come from. Right, <laughs> right. Well, I think I'm gonna go eat dinner. All right. Thanks for chatting, guys. All right, and um, I will talk to you guys later. And um, yeah, Eric, I'm gonna respond to your statement because. I've done that, and I'll take care of it for you. <laughs> the Oregon statement? Yeah. Oh, okay. Eric, um, if, if you're really interested, you need to buy a copy of the forthcoming book, um, Neverland's Library, because it will contain my story, the rendition of Ephraim Waite, which will explain why sort of the fog takes place on the West Coast and not the East Coast. Oh, you have a connection to the fog now? I do. You think as bad as me? Yeah, really. You are, you are, you already were as bad. As, you were already worse than me, probably. Oh, I, I just had to have crossovers. I know, yep. or at least. So, all right, guys. Good night. All right. See you guys. Talk to you guys in a few days. All right, bye. Bye.